Jordan Peterson. 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 I know that this video is going to get a large number of dislikes, but whatever. Let's get into this. In the past couple of years, I've dealt on and off with depression and loneliness. I'm a grad student in engineering, and I definitely understand how busy, lonely, and stressful a time it can be. Consequently, I don't blame someone too much for finding an outlet for help, whatever that outlet may be. People are complex and can find hope and help in many things. I have found some of Jordan Peterson's lectures helpful, and I definitely think there are some people hell-bent on mischaracterizing him and his views. I mean, that sounds pretty bad. You're saying it's there's a bad. crisis of masculinity? I mean, but you're just saying that's the way it is. Well, it's, I'm not saying anything. It's just an observation. So, so if you want women domination... women want to dominate. Is that what you're saying? No, I'd say women... Right, so you've, you're saying you've done your research and women... Okay, you said it was it's making the them miserable. Thing. Yes, it is. And it... But you're saying basically it doesn't matter if women aren't. You're saying, well, that's just a fact of no, life. Women it aren't necessarily matter. going to get to the top. You're saying I'm it's saying a fact of life. I'm saying there are multiple reasons for it. Yeah, but... So you were saying that by and large, women are too agreeable to. <laughs> make it stop! Oh, make it stop! However, I do draw the line when such outlets can become harmful. This extends to nonsense like alternative medicine and certain worldviews offered under the guise of self-help. Additionally, as someone who sees himself as a modernist, we'll get into that soon, who desires progress at the level of the individual and the society, I have to take issue with some of his ideas. Now, this will not be a take on Jordan Peterson's self-help advice, or at least too much of one. It won't be a take on his newest book, 12 Rules for Life, nor will it be a take on his earlier book, Maps of Meaning, The Architecture of Belief. My issue is with meaningless pseudo-philosophical word effluvium and socially detrimental ideas. This is a take on Peterson's grievance with the left and activism, a grievance that I have to some degree, and what he posits as a solution to it which I find absolutely counter to anything that could remotely be called the Enlightenment. Some years ago, six to be exact, I watched a documentary film called Waiting for Armageddon. It's a fascinating view into the minds of apocalyptically minded Christians who obsess over the end times and the second coming of Christ. The following commentary on Christians in contemporary society from a pastor by the name of Scott Nelson occurs roughly 10 minutes into the film. Take a look. Today, Christians are becoming increasingly vulnerable to a worldview that certainly resulted in the persecution of the Jews under the Nazis. And whether you had uh, Nazis celebrating the Aryan race and, uh, and denigrating the Jew, uh, today you have multiculturalists celebrating uh, the feminist and uh, the gay lifestyle and denigrating the white European male. The film ends with a conference in Dallas, Texas for believers of pre-tribulation theology. This is the idea that Jesus will return before the tribulation. Here, postmodernism is lambasted as leading people away from a literal reading of the Bible. Another pastor named H. Wayne House gets up and says postmodernism is a worldview fine for the hearts and minds of the whole world he subsequently goes on to implicate postmodernism in interpreting the constitution as a living document in the 1973 case of roe versus wade the legalization of abortion and the decline in biblical literalism are the lamentations of these enemies of postmodernism such lamentations say quite a bit about their worldview, though. What happens when we apply the same experiment to Jordan Peterson? Anyone familiar with Jordan Peterson's work is familiar with his main attack on quote-unquote postmodern neo-Marxist ideology as enemies of Western civilization. Now, who the hell are these people? Well, let's define some terms first. Postmodernism is defined as 
Any number of trends or movements in the art and literature developed in the 1970s in reaction to or rejection of the dogma, principles, or practices of established modernism, especially a movement in architecture and the decorative arts running counter to the practice and influence of the international style and encouraging the use of elements from historical vernacular styles, often playful illusion, decoration, and complexity. In the above lexicographical entry, postmodernism is contrasted with modernism. Modernism is thusly defined as a deliberate philosophical and practical estrangement or divergence from the past in the arts and literature occurring especially in the course of the 20th century and taking form in any of various innovative movements and styles. Neo-Marxism is a development of Marx's original theory of economics and the drivers of history. This development incorporates aspects of 20th century philosophy such as existentialism, Freudian psychoanalysis, and absurdism. Now, I am neither a postmodernist nor a Marxist of any kind, but I am on the left. My first criticism is what I see as an oxymoron. Postmodernism and any kind of Marxism seem to be at odds with each other. In its rejection of grand narratives or meta narratives, Postmodernism is heavily criticized by Marxists as not dealing with the meta-narratives of class struggle and inequality. Similar criticisms find their place in other parts of the left, as Noam Chomsky, who is not a Marxist, says, uh, The place where it's been really harmful is in the third world, because third world intellectuals are badly needed in the popular movements. They can make contributions, and a lot of them are just drawn away from this. Uh, anthropologists and sociologists and others, they're drawn away into these arcane, uh, in my view, mostly meaningless discourses and are dissociated from popular struggles. And you can see the, uh, you can see the impact. I mean, I've had experiences around the third world are kind of unfair. We won't even talk about them, but they, re they really indicate uh, how the level of irrationality that grows out of this undermines uh, the opportunities for uh, doing something really significant and important. This is Noam Chomsky's criticism of postmodernism, one with which I fully agree, but Peterson has a different view. He blames postmodern neo-Marxists for the atrocities of the Soviet Union in the 20th century particularly the Holodomor famine. To understand this, you have to understand Peterson's worldview, particularly as it relates to the left's supposed demonization of upper class or, quote, privileged groups. So for him, such demonization found itself directed at the Kulaks, the 1930s landowning peasants in modern day Ukraine, Tatarstan, and Kazakhstan. The Kulaks were persecuted by Joseph Stalin during the collectivization period. In his 2017 lecture, Maps of Meaning for Marionettes and Individuals, he explains this concept in relation to Pinocchio being given a fake diagnosis of illness, which he relates to a diagnosis of victimhood on the part of groups who are not so privileged. The fox convinces Pinocchio that he's sick. He, he, he performs a lot of tricks to do this. Now, you could say that Pinocchio is susceptible to this because maybe there's still part of him that's looking for the easy way out. And so, one of the things that Maya and I found when we were writing this paper, we were looking at the discourse that precedes genocide in genocidal states. And the enhancement of a sense of victimization on the part of one of the groups, usually the group that's going to commit the genocide, first of all, their sense, as vi their sense of being victims is much heightened by the demagogues who are trying to stir up this sort of hatred. So they basically say, look, you've been oppressed in a variety of ways, and these are the people who did it, and they're not going to stop doing it, and this time we're going to get them before they get us. Now, in an excerpt from the lecture entitled, When Victimhood Leads to Genocide, Professor Jordan Peterson on Dekulakization, Peterson says, Because there's, there's a point that's being made, and the point is that people have been oppressed and they suffer. And that's true, that point. But that's 
But then the proper framework from within which to interpret that, I believe, is that that's characteristic of life. You, you, you can't take it personally in some sense. And you can't divide the world neatly into perpetrators and victims. And you certainly can't divide the world neatly into perpetrators and victims and then assume that you're only in the victim class and then assume that that gives you certain, like access to certain uh, forms of redress, let's say. This is another way of naturalizing the distinct marginalization that people face. Would this apply to Martin Luther King or to Thomas Paine? If a certain type of marginalization attacks someone's person, what choice does such a person have not to take it personally? But it gets a bit worse than that because Jordan Peterson's comparison to the kulaks of the Caucasus in Central Asia is totally backwards. Marginalized groups are not necessarily jealous of dominant groups because of their success. Rather, it is often that dominant groups have largely built their success on the subjugation of those groups. Peterson goes on to say, But there's going to be some people who are not happy about it at all, that are going to be very resentful about that and jealous. And so those are going to be people whose characters, I would say, are of the less positive type. And so when the intellectuals came in and described the reason that these people should be treated as parasites and profiteers, then it was the resentful minority in those towns and that would be the kind of guy that hangs around in the bar all the time and is completely unconscientious and fails at everything and then blames everyone else for it. The intellectuals came in and said, here's, this is unfair that this happened to you. You've actually been victimized and now it's your opportunity to go have your revenge. And so that's exactly what happened. In this construction, the minorities are resentful and unconscientious, in addition to failing at everything and hanging around in the bar all the time. Peterson's analogy with the Kulaks denigrates marginalized groups by implication in the way it portrays them. However, Peterson's Kulak analogy does hold up a different way. A good comparison with the plight of the Kulaks would be the destruction of Black Wall Street in Tulsa, where a group of African Americans freed from slavery went to Tulsa, Oklahoma, despised by the white people of the surrounding area, built a successful community for themselves. This community was not exploitative. On the contrary, it was so financially protectionist that a single dollar stayed within the community for an average of a year before leaving it. What happened? This community was bombed with nitroglycerin airstrikes from a crop dusting plane in 1921 after a lie about a white woman being raped by a black man was used to justify invading it and destroying it. Wilmington, North Carolina, where the first and only successful coup in American history took place, has a similar story. For Peterson, the frustration of marginalized groups and their urgency to change the status quo is born out of resentment and jealousy rather than the social conditions that have been made for them. In his first interview with Russell Brand, he described why he believes the solution to inequality is psychological rather than sociological. The temptation towards resentment and destruction that's associated with sociological approaches to inequality is too great and that as a consequence those those movements tend inexorably to become corrupt and destructive because i think orwell put his finger on it when he said that middle class socialists don't like the poor they just hate the rich peterson sees this mentality among postmodern neo-marxists as responsible for the atrocities of the Soviet Union. This is a rather anachronistic placement of blame in my estimation. As we see from the lexicographical entry previously shown, postmodernism is a movement that began in the 1970s. Stalin's purges and enforced famines occurred in the 1930s. The sort of artistic and cultural freedom that allowed for postmodernism to develop was ushered in by Nikita Khrushchev, who took power after Stalin's death in 1953. And even then, this relative artistic freedom developed into postmodernism in France, not modern day Russia. Back at the time of Prokofiev's return to the USSR in 1936, Dmitry Shostakovich, a generation younger and until then wunderkind of the communist regime, had suddenly become persona non grata. 
Stalin himself had attended Shostakovich's opera Lady Macbeth of Mitsensk, and subsequently the piece was denounced as muddle instead of music. Two decades later, in 1957, a year after Khrushchev had given a speech denouncing Stalin's legacy and heralding a period of relative cultural freedom, Shostakovich's 11th symphony premiered in Moscow. How does Peterson justify his antipathy? His claim is that the modern humanities are hell-bent on disrupting the fundamental structures of Western civilization. In a lecture given in the summer of 2017, Peterson said, The postmodernists turned the Marxist emphasis on economics into an emphasis on power in the 1970s, and I think they did that as a form of sleight of hand because by the late 1960s and early 1970s, it was obvious even to people as intransigent as someone, as say Jean-Paul Sartre, which, who refused to denounce the Communist Party until that late in the, in the progression of the 20th century. It became obvious even to people like that that there was just no way that you could maintain your intellectual and moral credibility and remain a supporter of standard communist doctrine. Part of the sleight of hand was, oh, it's not about economic power, it's about oppression and op oppressed and oppressor on a broader sense, and that's where we got the transformation into identity politics, which is just the Marxist oppressor oppressed doctrine under a new guise. It seems that Peterson attributes identity politics to Marxism. However, even in his characterization, of the derivation of identity politics from Marxism, Peterson still gets Marxism wrong. Marxism is a dynamic of the exploited proletariat versus the exploitative bourgeoisie. This is important because Marxism is purely economically materialist. It is entirely about economics and class. Under Marxism, oppression on the basis of identity functions as an epiphenomenon of underlying economic issues. The Marxist meta-narrative is one of class struggle, but the oppressor-oppressed dynamic Peterson falsely ascribes to Marxism is also a meta-narrative and thus also antithetical to postmodernism regarding identity politics. I mentioned this previously in my video on the right-wing criticism of identity politics, that Peterson has no sense of how these groups are seen by the left. His view of identity politics does not start with how certain groups of people, minorities, are originally treated. For Peterson, it starts with the attempts to right the wrongs of history in regard to these groups. This is to say that identity politics, for Peterson, is a new phenomenon. He clarifies this in an interview with Helen Lewis for British GQ, saying plainly, The United States wasn't founded on identity politics. Yes, it was. A very irrational claim for anyone who has any understanding of US history. But it shows Peterson's bias. Peterson centers the resistance to marginalization constituted by the movements for social change and progress in his understanding of identity politics, not the marginalization itself. This is Peterson's deliberate construction. Now, when examining an argument, it is not only good to look at the points made, it is an additional benefit to examine who or what is served with such an argument. This is far from conspiratorial. Rather, it helps craft an understanding of how such a message can and will be received at large. Peterson's argument against identity politics only serves the current state of affairs. Indeed, Peterson deploys the right-wing criticism of identity politics, one that I have previously shot down in another video. The real identity politics is the identity politics of the oppression. All else is secondary. When it comes to race in America, the real identity politics is the identity politics of redlining. It's the identity politics of predatory lending. It's the identity politics of racially motivated urban planning, of lynching, slavery, scientific racism, Jim Crow, slave codes, stigmatizing black women's hair as a sexual distraction, segregation, systemically impoverished neighborhoods, voter suppression, the drug war, the destruction of Black Wall Street, human experimentation, and human zoos. These events have effects that still exist. However, do right-wingers acknowledge these realities? Barely, if at all. Often, for them, the benchmark for white identity politics is taken to be Richard Spencer, Jason Kessler, and David Duke. 
everything short of that is just fine. But there's a subtly disingenuous way he does this. Let's return to the same interview with Helen Lewis. Peterson earlier made a left-wing criticism of identity politics, one that I am currently writing about, saying... Oh, okay. It's certainly the case, too, that this identity politics battle of ideas was a determining factor in the last American election. If Hillary wouldn't have played identity politics, played cozy with the identity politics types, she would have kept the working class and she would be president now. So these aren't trivial issues. Peterson first deploys the left-wing criticism of identity politics, the use of identity as a cover for an ostensibly anti-class politics, i.e. neoliberal tokenism. He switches to the right-wing criticism of identity politics 18 minutes later. The United States wasn't founded on identity yes, politics. Yes, it was. Does he think that left-wing positions are inherently more intelligent? Or did he do that to grant a platform of credibility to his subsequent talking points? I neither know nor care, but I recognize that the right cynically co-ops criticism of identity politics to make all left-wing movements seem inherently elitist while pretending to care about working people. Author Angela Nagel analyzes this form of Trump apologia in her book, Kill All Normies, Online Culture Wars from 4chan and Tumblr to Trump and the alt-right, saying, Although the idea that ordinary people felt alienated by political correctness was not uncommon in right-wing rhetoric, there was also quite a remarkable shift from a subcultural elitism to a sudden proletarian righteousness, or even a bit of noblesse oblige, as though the right had been making Thomas Frank's argument all along. In reality, they had been making pro-inequality, misanthropic, economically elitist arguments for natural hierarchy all along. Much of Peterson's worldview is about naturalizing hierarchies, so his use of Thomas Frank's argument is ersatz. This is especially true with Peterson's debunked analogy to the neuroendocrine system of the lobster. The reason that I write about lobsters is because there's this idea that hierarchical structures are a sociological construct of the Western patriarchy. And that is so untrue that it's almost unbelievable. And I use the lobster as an example because the lobster, we, we div divulged from lobsters in evolutionary history about 350 million years ago, common ancestor. And lobsters exist in hierarchies and they have a nervous system attuned to the hierarchy. And that nervous system runs on serotonin, just like our nervous systems do. As explained in this video by Hugo and Jake, formerly known as the Bible Reloaded. Why is this relevant? For an amazing number of reasons. Uh. Apart from those that are comically obvious. First, we know that lobsters have been around in one form or another for more than 350 million years. Invoking nature as a fallacy one more time. This is a very long time. 65 million years ago, there were still dinosaurs. That is the unimaginatively distant past to us. To the lobsters, however, the dinosaurs were new way <laughs> were the new rich. And he uses the French word because he's pretentious. Who appeared and disappeared in the flow of near eternal time. That means that dominance hierarchies have been an essentially permanent fixture of the environment to which all complex life has adapted. A third of a billion years ago, brains and nervous systems were comparatively simple. Nonetheless, they already had the structure in neurochemistry. But did they? You can't prove that. I don't know. Like, like the idea that... Like, this could have popped up that many years ago, and I said it earlier, it would be no more or less, but the fact that he asserts that they had the same social structure that many years, like, it just, it irritates me because he's he's invoking, invoking some sort of superiority due to old age. Additionally, this is compounded by the fact that Peterson was featured in a video called Fix Yourself for Prager University. Peterson ends this video saying, The proper way to fix the world isn't to fix the world. There's no reason to assume that you're even up to such a task, but you can fix yourself. You'll do no one any harm by doing so. And in that manner, at least, you will make the world a better place. What exactly does this mean? It means that the activists protesting and grassroots movements for change are making fruitless noise. 
There's no use protesting an oppressive system if you can't first fix yourself. How would this argument hold up against the civil rights movement or the women's suffrage movement? Peterson expands on the statement in an interview on the Rubin Report with Dave Rubin, Ben Shapiro, and Eric Weinstein, the founder of the intellectual dark web, saying, What I've been suggesting to my audiences is get your act together as much as you possibly can, because the way that you deal with uncertainty is by being prepared for anything and everything that's going to come your way. That, and so you want to put yourself together so that when the difficult decisions come along, even though we can't predict what they are, you're going to be in the best possible there's solution. There's a new message here. The new me Individual improvement is a good thing and something that I am currently practicing as it relates to me. But using it to prepare for uncertainty is something quite different. What about economic uncertainty? How should this apply to the working class about whom Peterson supposedly cares? Should the working class simply get their act together as much as possible? Or should they be active against candidates who, in Peterson's words, play cozy with the identity politics types in favor of a more working class politics? Should a black woman affected by voter suppression efforts simply just get her act together, especially when she's 92 years old? This is how Peterson smuggles in a defense of the status quo, and Weinstein voices his disagreement with it later in the interview. The, the thing that you will have a hard time convincing me of, having gone through uh, the PhD system in the sciences, is that some of the world's most brilliant people hold PhDs in the sciences. And I came up at a time when, in the early 90s, these people were told that the world was their oyster and that we were desperately in need of scientists. And I remember a friend of mine being told that he had a $14,000 a year job offer post-PhD from MIT with a pregnant wife. Mm -hmm. And the person who offered it was like, this is great. We can, we can, we can get people for pennies. Mm -hmm. Right. And right. why was that? It was because of something that came out of the National Academy of Sciences and the National Science Foundation to slam American workers in the sector. This is very, very important. It had predicted that people would be paid six figures for, for PhDs, uh, which was you know larger than they had been paid for a long time. And it was the meddling with the market. The thing that I don't like about the personal responsibility issue is, is that individuals should not be solving the problems of, let's say, tech groups getting together and say we will not poach each other's employees. That like the market has to work for people, not just institutions. Mm -hmm. And if you're in a sector in which you can make the market work for you, you have this feeling of anybody can do this. And in fact, what you need to do is you need to migrate to these sectors because there are other sectors where you have, let's say, government intervention, which says we are going to interfere with the free working of the market, or we are not going to take into account that some people produce public goods. And so it's very important to me to, to understand that some people are coming out of very different circumstances in which it's very unlikely that they will be able to make their world uh, you know, grow and blossom, and that other people of extraordinary ability and high IQ and work ethic find themselves not fighting forces that they don't even well, understand. Well, this is the sort of criticism that's often levied at me because people say, well, you don't take the systemic problem sufficiently into account. And, and so that's a nice outline of the systemic problems. You know, when, when the banks decided that they should be self-regulating uh, with respect uh, you know, to, to their gearing ratios or the risk, um, there was one guy who rode in at this, to this SEC hearing to allow these investment banks to you know, do the last little bit before 2008 uh, blew up everything. This guy, Len Bollet, who was a computer consultant to banks, it's like one guy in the entire country hmm. saw a disaster coming and got involved in this internal game that was a by banks for banks and so what's very important to me is to understand when you have bad behavior by institutions it is pathological to put that responsibility on individual shoulders as scott oliver put it in his piece in vice a philosophy of personal responsibility is one thing but repeatedly insisting that your destiny as an individual is primarily a matter of better life choices and fitting in by insisting 
that is, on the myth of the self-made man, Peterson not only plays down the crucial importance of politics and economics in the shaping of our lives, but also denies the malleability of that reality. It just is, so deal with it. From all of what has been previously shown in this video, it is clear that Peterson cannot possibly maintain this illusion of himself as a soldier for modernism in light of his worldview. His insistence on the individual is not meant as a bulwark against an irrational collectivism, something that I actually care about as someone on the left. It is a denial of our ability to use reason to make sociological change. After all, our reason allows us to predict economic meltdowns in a country of over 300 million people. To endorse a worldview that denies or downplays this isn't modernism. On the contrary, it's very much in line with postmodernism. Keeping the status quo and shaming any attempt to change it isn't modernism. Pushing blatant climate change denial as honest inquiry isn't modernism. Casting doubt on the competency of same-sex couples to raise children isn't modernism. Being gay and in a long-term relationship, we are considering kids. What are your thoughts about gay people raising children? Um, I think the devil's in the details, to tell you the truth. When, if I was ever talking to any individuals about that, that's, it, the question is, well, how would you raise them? I mean, you have problems, right? Fear-mongering about how the birth control pill might do the West in as a civilization isn't modernism. Don't underestimate the significance of the birth control pill. It's like the hydrogen bomb or the, or the computer chip. It's a world revolutionary technology. And for all we know, it might do us in. You know, I mean, in the West, the birth rate is far below replacement. And, you know, that's as a, as a multi-generational strategy, that's just, that's an absolute dead end. And of course, no one can talk about that because, well, for, for obvious, the obvious reasons of egalitarianism and diversity and, and all of that. But... Uh, the declining birth rate in the West is really, I would say, a, a, a catastrophe. Refusing to acknowledge the variations and complexity of gender expression in everyday life isn't modernism. Affirming the centrality of patriarchy to Western civilization, going so far as to lash out at the movie Frozen, isn't modernism. In one of your lectures, you said the film Frozen was garbage. I don't think I said garbage. I say, think I said reprehensible propaganda, which I believe it was. Can you elaborate on your thoughts on the film? I can't because I haven't seen it recently enough to... Um, the only thing I can say is that I left the film with a strong sense that it was produced for ideological reasons and it was produced as a sort of anti-sleeping beauty and I felt that, that was entirely inappropriate because it wasn't a genuine artistic attempt, it was an ideological statement. I actually really liked Moana, I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. I thought it was, that. I liked that, you know, that little girl in the movie allied herself with this very, very powerful but rather uncivilized masculine force and I thought they got the archetypal balance in that film really quite, really quite nicely so uh, I thought it was quite beautifully done so I liked Moana quite a bit. Calling women who complain about sexual assault in the workplace hypocritical because they wear makeup isn't modernism. Is there sexual what? harassment in the workplace? Yes. Should it stop? That'd be good. Will it? Well, not at the moment it won't because we don't know what the rules are. Do you think men and women can work in the workplace together? I don't know. Without sexual harassment? We'll see. We'll see. How many years will it take for men and women working in the workplace together More than 40. to get a sense? We don't know what the rules are. Like, what? here's a rule. Don't, don't How about no makeup in the workplace? Why would that be a rule? <laughs> Why should you wear makeup in the workplace? Uh, Isn't that sexually provocative? No. It's not? No. Well, what is it then? What's the purpose of makeup? Some people would like to just put on makeup. Why? To, 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 I don't know why Why do you make your lips red? Because they turn red during sexual arousal. That's why. Why do you put rouge on your cheeks? Same reason. This, I mean, look. How about high heels? What, what are mean, they what for? What about high heels? What about them? They're there to exaggerate sexual attractiveness. That's what high heels do. Now, I'm not saying that people shouldn't use sexual displays in the workplace. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that that is what they're doing. And that is what they're doing. If, if, do you feel like a serious woman who does not want sexual harassment in the workplace, do you feel like if she wears makeup in the workplace that she is somewhat being critical? Yeah. Okay. I do think that. 
blaming secular humanism for the atrocities of the Soviet Union isn't modernism. But when you hold Christ up as a particular figure, the only information that I have about Jesus comes from the Bible. And rather than going through all of it again, because there's lots of people with questions, if you go to ironchariots.org, you will find a verse-by-verse -verse deconstruction of the Sermon on the Mount where I point out that Jesus gave some good advice and some crappy advice and some questionable advice, and that's not enough. And there's not a secular humanist organization or country on the planet that has ever produced as a good thing, an intentional good thing, rapists and murderers. So. Well, that's, deb that's highly debatable. That's highly debatable. Actually, I mean, one it's of the things absolutely true because there's never been a secular humanist government on the planet. I don't know. I think the Soviets were pretty secular. No, humanist. they. Then, well, I know with, that... with, all, with all due apologies, you do not know the first thing about what secular humanism is. You should read the Secular Humanist Manifestos because what happened in Russia in communist countries was an institution of a religious like structure surrounded around, centered around an individual and forced atheism, none of which is consistent with humanism. None of it. And, and, and we can talk about this, this later, and I'll be happy to point you to this, because you can say that it was an atheist thing um, that went awry, but you can't call it secular humanism. It, it's just not there. There's no humanism in what was done there. But The above ideas represent pre-modern traditionalism, and therein lies the contradiction in Peterson's worldview. He is a pre-modernist, in that he repackages the old order of things and presents it as new, but a postmodernist in his loony view of truth and his skepticism of how much good sociological change can be made through our current understanding of economic, environmental, and geopolitical realities. Such a worldview only makes for a politics that is profoundly unenlightened. Jordan Peterson is a modern-day Anthony Comstock, a doomsayer, an apocalyptic preacher, not unlike those featured in the aforementioned documentary film. His is an ersatz theology of hope for those who want to maintain the social status of the dominant groups under the guise of maintaining hierarchies of competence, and whose apocalypse is an ultimate abolition of the oppressive traditions of the past. However, Peterson is right in one aspect. The power of myth is very real, and the myths with which people align themselves can profoundly shape their worldview. Peterson's personal myth is that the good old days, for which he seems to have a somewhat pressing nostalgia, were ever really that good. This myth is not particularly uncommon. The toxic campaign of this current presidential administration was built on it. We will make America great again. It's about time we abandoned this myth and became truly modernized. Thanks for watching. Atheism, in its negation of gods, is at the same time the strongest affirmation of man, and through man, the eternal yea to life, purpose, and beauty.